us off at number 10, Ghost Stories. Growing up, my family always watched A Christmas Carol, every year, without fail. Now as much as I loved the movie as a kid, I always remember thinking it was a little weird to have a Christmas story about ghosts haunting an old man. But as it turns out, ghost stories were actually a very normal, if not celebrated part of the season back in the day. During the cold winter months, with nothing but a fire to keep you company, families would pass time by sharing tales of spooks and monsters, and that might be why there are so many dark old folklore creatures that only pop up during the winter solstice. Now listen, I love a scary story as much as the next guy, but for me I'd rather keep that in the spooky season and just enjoy my hot apple cider in peace. Coming in at number 9, Snapdragon. Who doesn't love a good Christmas game, right? Well, if you are looking to keep your eyebrows, I might suggest not bringing this one back into your rotation. Snapdragon was a family game where you'd stand around around a table where a shallow bowl filled with a few dozen raisins or really any other small floating fruit or nut would be placed. But here's where it gets crazy. They would fill the bowl up with brandy and then light it on fire. From there the actual game started and the goal was to reach into the bowl of flaming raisins, grab one and then try to put out the fire by popping it in your mouth. Now <laughs> maybe I'm just a wimp, but I have scalded my tongue on hot chocolate that was a little too hot, so I'm not sure I'm built for putting out a literal flaming object. Although I am sure the brandy soaked fruit tasted great after the flames went down. Coming in at number 8, first footing. This ancient tradition started from the idea that in order to have a year of good luck, you needed to have the most fortunate kind of person possible be the first one in your home after midnight of the new year. It was believed the best kind of person was a dark haired man bearing symbolic gifts like bread, coins, salt, coal or whiskey, as these represented a year of good food, wealth, flavor, warmth and merriment. So it was like this strange race to get the most handsome dark haired man in town to bring you bread after midnight. Now of course there were also people who could give you bad luck. Should a doctor be on your doorstep, it was believed you would have a year of bad health, and a minister would hint that a funeral was coming that year. And even worse would be if a woman was the first to arrive. But the most unlucky first foot of all that could greet you at your doorstep was anyone with red hair. Coming in at number 7. Yule Lads. There is plenty of creepy winter folklore that comes from hundreds of years ago, and one of these tales are the Yule Lads. This legend comes from Iceland, and as the tale goes, Yule Lads would appear during the winter season to make young people's lives excruciatingly difficult. They were made up of 13 different creatures that were said to be descendants of monsters, and each had a unique method for wreaking havoc, like stealing farm animals or traumatizing young people in the dark. Darkness. But even worse was their pet cat, whose diet was based solely on young flesh. Unlike other folklore creatures, this cat doesn't care if you're naughty or nice. It will eat whatever is in its way. Allegedly the tale caused such a ruckus around the season that the government eventually banned parents from telling the tale. Next up at number 6, Mistletoe Pardon. Although it existed through many different cultures winter holidays years prior, it wasn't until Tudor England when the mistletoe began and its long standing tradition of being a romantic gesture where one kissed beneath it. And although it's kind of hard to imagine it symbolizing anything but that, at one point in time, the York Minster Church in the UK used the festive plant for a special mistletoe service each winter. During the service, criminals of the town could come bringing a sprig of mistletoe and be pardoned for their wrongdoings and receive forgiveness from God and the church. And while the sentiment is, you know, kind of sweet, I mean, can you imagine if thieves, frauds, killers could just bring a sprig of mistletoe to the church now to solve all of their problems? Well, of course this isn't practiced anymore. Many churches do still have a mistletoe hanging on the altar as a nod to the tradition. Coming in at number 5, the bird. Okay. I know what you're thinking, the turkey is like the calling card of a modern Christmas. Well, while we kept the tradition of a roasted bird, the way that we serve it to the table for our guests has 
thankfully changed. During medieval times, kings and queens loved a spectacle. They loved being a little extra. And while I can relate to the enthusiasm, I'm not so much on board with the outcome. It was all the rage at the time to serve the bird looking as if it were still alive. So they would carefully skin the bird, being sure that all the feathers remained, roast it, and then sew the skin back on to really give it that being eaten alive look. The most prestigious bird you could serve was a peacock as it was very exotic and once the skin was back on you could bring the colorful bird to your table almost like a piece of art. While I am I guess you could say intrigued by this as an abstract concept, I quite literally never want to see this with my own eyes as long as I live. Coming in at number 4, Calicants Roy. It's said that these mischievous little goblins only emerge from their usual home in the center of the earth during the 12 days of Christmas. Often described as black furry creatures with tusks, horns and tails, there are actually many different kinds of these troublesome little goblins, each with their own name and traits. The Calicansa Troy can only ever be seen at night, as they're afraid of the sun and they come trying to wreak havoc. Upon their nightly visits, they will climb into your house either by window or chimney, and then once inside, taunt and terrorize your family until dawn. But luckily, they are not the smartest of demons and won't count to three, as this number is considered holy. So all you have to do to keep them away is put a colander on your doorstep and the goblins will be paralyzed by the number of holes and spend all night terrified of uttering the number three. Coming in at number three, wassailers. During the 17th century, carolers, or wassailers as they were called, brought a very different energy to the Christmas season. Back then, instead of greeting you on your lawn or at your door with a holiday carol or two, they would show up unannounced and demand the residents best food and drink to be handed over. And while they did sing in a roundabout manner, it was less about good old Saint Nick and more like a protest or chant that they shouted while threatening violence, destroying the property, and even committing SA. A historian named Thomas Christensen says the lyrics were often something along the lines of, quote, we've come here to claim our right and if you don't open up your door, we'll lay it flat on the floor. One minister in the early 18th century spoke out against the practice of Christmas entirely, but especially the carolers, as he complained that the custom drove people to rioting and maliciousness. And while I am the last person that would want to cancel Christmas entirely, I do kind of have to agree with his point about the carolers. Next up at number 2, Hans Trap. In the eastern corner of France lies a country named Alsace. And unlike other places whose demons often take the form of goats or goblins, their lore is about a scarecrow. As the legend goes, a man named Hans Trapp, who was notorious for his greed and crooked values, used witchcraft to make a deal with the devil and become a very rich man. But after finding out about his pact with Satan, he was excommunicated from the church and ended up losing all of his wealth and status. With nowhere to turn, Hans went to the countryside and disguised himself as a scarecrow so as not to be found out by the town. But after some time, he began to develop a desire for human flesh and lured a young shepherd boy to his death and cooked him over a fire. But before he could take his first bite, God struck him with lightning and Hans died. But the young people of Alsace were told that the ghost of Hans would return during Christmas, roaming the streets looking for a tasty bit of flesh to devour from badly behaved young. And last up in our number one spot today, Frau Perchta. If there is one thing that people feared above all in olden days was witches, and among them was the terrifying legend of Frau Perchta. This witch originated from Austria and she comes to see who has been naughty or nice. Often she is depicted as having a beaked nose made of iron and dressed in rags, carrying a long hidden knife under her skirts. But unlike many of the other terrifying 
terrifying traditional visitors, she was not just there for the young in their beds, but for the ladies of the house too. For if you did not have all your flax spun by the twelfth night, she would set your unfinished weaving aflame. But worse than that, if you forgot to leave out her bowl of porridge, she would come up to your room, slit open your stomach, and replace your organs with rocks and straw. And I mean, that is much worse than a bit of coal in your stocking if you ask me. Number 10. Mince Meat Pie A traditional English Christmas dish, mince meat pies have a somewhat colorful history. Originally known as tarts of flesh, nice. The recipe has seen various iterations, though sometimes the ingredients were a bit more unique than the recipient might have expected. According to some legends, mince meat pies might have been baked with beef, chicken, uncles, kings, you name it. These stories hold sway in many hearts. As a number of fictional works have used the concept as a means of discreetly disposing of a body. Whether or not this is accurate remains to be seen, but I'll stick to pumpkin pie anyways. Number 9. Kalikantzeros A creature originating from Greece, they are believed to hide underground, chewing on the trunk of the world tree. But when Christmas rolls around, these beasties climb to the surface to wreak havoc amongst the populace, giving the tree time to heal. There are many ways to combat these beasts, one being to leave a colander on your doorstep. Now see, supposedly these creatures are incapable of counting beyond the number 2. If they ever pronounce the holy word of three, they'll be forced to take their own life. So when faced with a colander, the Kalikantzeros will be forced to sit and count each hole, stuck until the sun rises and forces them back underground again. Number 8. Belschnickel One of the companions of Saint Nicholas, the Belschnickel comes to us from Germany, and just like every word in the German language, he's violent and horrifying. According to the legends, this fur clad figure stalks the night, armed with a switch in one hand and a bag of goodies in the other. If you weren't raised near a forest, a switch is a bundle of thin and soft branches you use to smack the ever living badness out of anyone who's being a bit naughty. The legend wasn't landlocked Deutschland, and made its way with immigrants to Pennsylvania, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia in the 1800s. A balance between benevolent and brutal, Belschnickel is not a legend to be brushed aside. Seriously, keep clear of this crowd. Number 7. The Yule Cat Also known as Yolokotarin, the Yule Cat is a massive creature that stalks the Icelandic countryside come winter. Though I'm pretty sure it's always winter there. I don't know, it's called Iceland, right? It'd be stupid to call it that if it wasn't covered in ice all the time, right? Anyways, this terrible tabby is the pet of another legend we'll get to, and supposedly has a taste for man flesh. Or at least that's what farmers would tell their workers to get their work done faster. Apparently, the legend goes that if your drip is particularly whack, the Yule Cat will go for you first. So workers that did well got better clothes. Number 6. Gryla Another Icelandic creature, Gryla is a massive woman dressed as a beggar. She stalks the night, offering to take in anyone who's been naughty under her wing, promising to raise them as her own. This is, of course, a lie, as her favored food is the flesh of fools, a supply which legends claim never runs dry. Gryla is also the owner of the Yule Cat and the mother to the Yule Lads, a cast of 13 who engage in generally harmless games of trickery and mischief. To drive away this deceptive damsel, all one needs to do is scatter food or just, you know, chase her away. That usually does the trick, but if there's someone in your family who's being a bit of a pest, well, it's an option, that's just all I'll say. Number 5. Necht Ruprecht Boss of the Belschnickel and companion of Saint Nicholas, Necht Ruprecht finds a way to be extremely worse than his switch-snapping brother. Where others bring gifts, Ruprecht is deeply religious, demanding whether or not anyone within his sight prays regularly. If they do, they are given nuts, apples, and other sweets, but if they don't, they are given garbage and switches for others to beat them with. And really, that's just so German. Even the punishments are delegated to other people. Number 4. Frau Perkta This fatal Frau has been around far longer than the Snates and the Schnickels. Perkta takes one of two forms, either appearing in white and unsullied cloth, or haggard and ruined shambles. Supposedly a shapeshifter, Perkta is said to have one foot larger than the other, as with 
all Christmas legends, she was a keeper of moral justice, though for some reason she was extremely against people weaving during the holidays. Either way, when her victims behaved, they'd receive a coin of silver. If they didn't, she'd pop open their stomachs and jam as much straw as she could into the cavities, then re-sew them up and send them on their way. Number 3. Hans Trapp I know he sounds German, but this legend actually originates from France. Generally kept to the regions of Alsace and Lorraine, Hans Trapp was originally a German knight. Oh, come on, they're all German. Why do Germans hate Christmas so much? Anyways, Hans was apparently big into partying and theft, to the point where he was supposedly excommunicated by the Pope. He then apparently sold his soul to the devil to keep on partying, which gave him a thirst for flesh. Now bound to the rules of hell, he could only eat sinners, which meant that Christmas time was the perfect time to do some light lunching. Now, some legends say that Saint Nicholas may have employed Hans as a method of keeping his followers in check, but he might have someone better for that task. Number 2. Krampus Yeah, this one's a doozy. Recently popularized through Hollywood films, Krampus has become known as the Anti-Santa. Generally depicted as a demon, Krampus may have been an interpretation of Hans Trapp, though there isn't much linking the two historically speaking. Krampus was well known to accompany Saint Nicholas, who would only concern himself with good followers and delegate the job of dealing with the baddies to his devilish companion, who would generally just drag them to hell. How this would happen varies depending on the region, but regardless, the legend's opposition to the generally happy holidays has allowed him to persist in modern media culture with a 2015 horror film made in his name. Number 1. Mari Lloyd Originating from Wales, the Mari Lloyd is a tradition where a horse's skull is mounted on a pole and a white sheet draped over its head. Puppeted as a character in a series of puppet shows, the custom's origins are difficult to pin, having been practiced long prior to the arrival of Christianity on the British Isles. Now, Some suggest that it may have been a fertility god, where others claim that Mari might have been a reference to the Virgin Mary of the Christian faith. Now, Mari is generally seen accompanying characters both new and old, brought into people's houses where she engages in a series of rude rhymes. I if she's allowed entry, the house is considered blessed with good fortune, though Mari might try to steal things and chase folks that she loves likes, but never seems to wish harm despite her morbid appearance. Some believe her to be a god of death, but with her mannerisms being so well recorded, it's a wonder why her history isn't. Perhaps she's a reminder of something else. But even though it's seen pushback from Christian fundamentalists, Mari Lloyd is still practiced today. Terrifying. Ephemeral, mischievous, but always present by your doorstep. Starting off this countdown, we have the Santa. In December 2011 in Berlin, a Santa Claus at the Alexanderplatz Christmas market was going around drugging young women after offering them a shot of alcohol. First off, I don't know about you, but I would not accept a beverage, let alone alcohol, from a dude dressed as Santa Claus. But apparently he convinced one girl to take a shot with him. Thankfully, the girl was with a friend who didn't take the shot. The one that did was left violently vomiting. Eight other women were victims to this as well. Some even passed out completely. So what did we learn today folks? Do not accept drinks from strangers, even if they're the Easter Bunny or Cupid or Santa Claus. Moving on at number 9 we have Killer Claus. I'm sorry, but what? Well I'm sorry, take a look at this mall Santa and tell me this isn't a character from the Purge series. Seriously, isn't this the mask that the characters in the Purge wear? I think so. Also, where are his eyeballs? This dude either has the biggest eyelids ever or he has no eyelids at all. I really don't know how that kid is smiling because Santa is looking quite creepy. And honestly, same with that elf in the background. If I pulled up to the mall and saw that thing sitting there, I'd grab my kid and leave so fast. That is not okay. In our 8th spot, we have Santa the Homicide Detective. Bet you didn't know that Santa used to solve murder cases and has the power to bring dead people back to life. 
This is a legend shared by French families on Christmas. In particular, they would tell their children about the story involving three kids that got lost in the woods. While trying to find their way back home, they stumble upon a butcher's house. They knock on the door and ask for help. However, kind of like Jack and Jill, the butcher invites them in and fattens them up. Then when they are sleeping, he chops them up and makes them into a meat dish to then sell. Seven years later, Santa is on the case. Don't know why it took him seven years, but okay. He ends up showing up at the butcher's house and asks him for some meat. He then confronts him about the missing people, sticks his fingers in a barrel of his meat, and then those three kids come back to life. And then they all lived happily ever after. I don't know about you, but that story kind of ruined Christmas for me. Santa needs to stick to the North Pole and helping his elves and Mrs. Claus, not murder victims. Moving on at number 7, we have White Faced Santa. So you're telling me that someone actually let this man out in the mall to take pictures with children like that? No one thought, hey, maybe ease up on the makeup, you'll look like a scary porcelain doll. The rosy cheeks and nose look anything but jolly. His skin literally looks fake, like he's wearing a mask, but he's not. And you're telling me that kids willingly hopped on his lap and parents were like, yeah, no, he doesn't seem sketchy at all. Excuse me, he looks like a demon from my nightmares. I've never seen a scarier Santa. Moving on to number six, we have the disease spreader. Back in December of 2006, it was discovered that the local mall Santa in Toledo was actually a carrier for the bacteria that causes meningitis. Turns out that he was spreading this to parents and other visitors. You know how many people the mall Santa sees daily? Hundreds. That means hundreds were exposed to him. Santa himself was an asymptomatic carrier of it. As a result, hundreds of families were notified and those who got really close with Sandy Claus were put on antibiotics as a precaution. Way to go Santa, way to ruin Christmas. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Santa. Uh, Santa, the camera is this way and her eyes are up there. This seems like the most action Santa has got in years. Not only is he getting frisky there, but he's not even being casual about it. He's fully staring at her boobies, and he's trying to cop a feel. That is very inappropriate, I'm telling Mrs. Claus. But in all seriousness, let's hope that this was a joke and that the poor woman was comfortable with it and consented to it. In our fourth spot, we have the indecent exposure. Imagine being young and excited to meet Santa Claus. You're standing in line, eagerly waiting when all of a sudden, Santa gets up and pants himself, exposing his candy canes and Christmas bulbs to everyone. That would be pretty traumatizing. Well, this happened in real life. It happened at the Walnut Grove Shopping Mall in Flagstaff, Arizona in 2014. Apparently, the mall's Santa Darnell Kendrickson got all upset because he wasn't allowed a break. So in retaliation, he went back to his Santa's chair, dropped his drawers, and began to touch himself. Thankfully, he was arrested shortly after and he was fined $50,000. And obviously, he was fired. What's sad though is that no one came to post his bail, so he was stuck inside prison over the holidays. That's not very merry. Moving on to number three, we have Jack Nicholson Santa. Now, why did I name this the Jack Nicholson Santa? Well, see for yourself. Here's Santa! Does he not look like Jack Nicholson from The Shining? Yes. Yes, he does. Why did Santa need to peel his eyes wide open like that? And what's with his facial expression? I'm genuinely concerned. It seems like he's on or he's hyped up on caffeine. Either way, I wouldn't want to get close to him. Next thing you know, he whips out an axe from under his chair and starts hacking up his elves. Moving on to number two, we have alien claws. I don't care what anybody says, aliens are real and this right here is an alien. This is not a human. This is an alien pretending to be Santa Claus. For starters, what's up with his forehead? Didn't know Santa had that bad of a receding hairline. Maybe that's why he likes wearing those red Christmas hats. He's over there looking like Megamind. Not only that, but what is on his face? I can't tell if it's prosthetics or a cheap scary mask. Either way, he looks terrifying. Santa's also looking a little stressed. 
Like, look at all those four headlines. Someone get this man some milk and cookies ASAP. Again, my question is, why did they think Santa actually looked good like this? Like, who allowed this? And in our number one spot today, we have the kidnapper clause. Who here would love to go back to the North Pole with Santa and become one of his little helpers? Well, back in 2015 in Florida, a crazed man dressed as Santa was going around a local mall trying to convince young shoppers that he was Santa and that they should come back to the North Pole with him and become one of his elves. He also said he had lots of toys out back for them. Obviously, this was just a kidnapping ploy. Thankfully, he was caught and arrested and no one got hurt. Starting off this countdown, we have mincemeat pie. Is anyone here actually a fan of mincemeat pie? Or like how old you have to be before you actually enjoy eating it? Well, if you said you do like it, I'm sorry, this legend might deter you from ever eating it ever again. Legend goes that this popular Christmas dish was invented in the 16th century as a way for humans to cook and eat other humans. Yeah, you heard me. Apparently back then some people would add humans to their mincemeat pie. That's where the meat came from. That is disgusting. Rumor has it that this legend is the reason why mincemeat pies no longer have meat in them. At least most don't. So uh, maybe think twice at the dinner table if someone serves this dish. Coming in at number nine, we have reselling donated toys. Imagine donating a bunch of toys to the less fortunate only for a store to take your donated items and resell them on their shelves. Pretty scummy, right? Well, legend goes that back in 2002, Walmart was doing just this. So in November, a Toys for Tots rep was outside of a Walmart in Colorado collecting toys for, for tots. Well, when they came back the next day, the toy box was empty. All the donated toys were placed on the shelves. Now, apparently this was done with malicious intent. It was done by complete accident, or so they say. There was some miscommunication between the store manager and his employees, and the toys were taken from the donation bin and put back on the shelves. Yikes. Wouldn't surprise me if other companies do this on purpose though, just saying. In our eighth spot, we have the chimney death. This is probably one of the most famous Christmas urban legends and it scared the crap out of me as a kid. So legend goes that on Christmas Eve, a father decided to dress up as Santa and slide down the chimney to surprise his wife and kids. However, while trying to get down, he got stuck and died of asphyxiation. That's not all though. His wife didn't know what her husband was doing, so later that night, she lit a fire. And shortly after, she realized a weird smell coming from the fireplace. When she looked up to see what was going on, she saw her dead husband's face staring right back at her. Way to ruin Christmas. Now apparently this is just an urban legend, whereas others insist that it is indeed true. Moving on at number seven, we have the poinsettias. This is another fairly famous Christmas legend. So poinsettias are often given as gifts around the holidays, but apparently they are very deadly, especially to pets and the young. Legend goes that eating the leaves of a poinsettia will kill you. So many people thought this was real that they were throwing out their red leafy plants. But turns out this is just a legend. A study found that humans and pets would need to eat about 500 leaves in order to get sick, which is unlikely to happen in the first place because apparently the leaves are very bitter. So if someone were to take a bite out of it, number one, they'd regret all their life choices, and two, they wouldn't get sick and die from it. Moving on at number six, we have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Apparently the origin of this song is incredible incredibly dark. Legend goes that it was created by a father to comfort his daughter whose mother was dying of cancer. Told you it was incredibly dark. So it was written in 1919 by a man named Robert May. At the time of writing the song, his wife was slowly dying of cancer, but apparently it wasn't written to distract his daughter or cheer her up. It was written as part of a promotional campaign for the department store that he worked for as a copywriter. I don't know who made up that legend in the first place, but that is very dark. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with The Killer Claws, another very famous urban legend. It was even featured in the 90s show Tales from the Crypt, Christopher's favorite show. <laughs> Basically, legend goes that on Christmas Eve, a wife ended up killing her husband. That same night, a patient from a psych ward escaped and went around killing people in a Santa Claus outfit. Eventually, he managed to find his way to this woman's home and goes around chasing her with an axe. The woman tries to outsmart the killer and the police by saying that the 
the killer Santa was the one who killed her husband. But her plan fails when her daughter ends up letting the killer into the house thinking that it was the real Santa Claus. And I'm sure you can imagine how this ends. The woman ends up getting axed. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Moral of the story, don't kill people and uh, don't try to outsmart killers. Coming in at number 4 we have the deadly Christmas trees. According to this next legend, people that have real fresh Christmas trees should be careful, for their tree could contain parasites that can make you incredibly sick. So legend goes that some Christmas trees have dormant ticks or tick eggs. When you bring them into your home, the ticks will become active and can go around biting your family or pets. As we all know, some ticks carry Lyme disease, which can make you incredibly, incredibly sick. And apparently, one female tick can latch 2,000 eggs under the bark of a tree. Imagine 2,000 eggs hatching in your home. Nope. I'm out of there. Well, thankfully, this is just a legend. First off, ticks are less active during the winter. Not only that, but ticks aren't born with Lyme disease. They get it after feeding on a diseased animal. So if a tick were on your tree and hatched, chances are it wouldn't be carrying Lyme disease. Plus, the odds of this all happening in the first place is so, so low. In our third spot, we have the candy canes. Do you love festive minty candy canes? If so, sorry, this next legend might ruin them for you. So legend goes that candy canes were created as a homage to Jesus Christ. If you flip that candy cane upside down, you get a J shape. J for Jesus. Not only that, but the white and red colorway is symbolic. The white symbolizes his innocence. The red, well, it symbolizes his blood. Isn't that Mary? Obviously, this is just a myth, but some believe it to be real. If it was real, I don't know about you, but I would feel weird sucking on candy meant to represent Jesus. In our second spot, we have the coded message. So apparently the 12 Days of Christmas song is just one big Christian coded message. So apparently the song was created as a way to spread the Christian faith during a time in Europe when having this faith was punishable by death. So the song was a way to help young Catholics learn the tenets of their faith. For example, true love is code for God. So on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me, aka God gave to me. And each gift that he gave is referenced to important important articles of the Christian faith. For example, 10 Lords of Leaping are the 10 commandments. Six Geese Alayan is the six days of creation, so on and so on. Now, this has been debunked, but you decide what you want to believe. And in our number one spot today, we have the exploding Christmas trees. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not allowed to have real Christmas trees in my apartment complex for the fear that they will spontaneously catch on fire. Apparently, this is a common fear. If you do have a real Christmas tree and you let it get dried out and then have hot Christmas lights on it, well, you're just asking for a problem. Now, it turns out that there is some truth behind this. Christmas trees can catch on fire if they do get really dried out, but they don't just randomly explode or come bust like in the legends. Plus the odds of it catching on fire are very rare. From 2006 to 2011, only 230 Christmas tree related fires happened. Nonetheless, please still be safe this holiday season. Number 9, Christmas Spiders. This one might sound scary, but it's actually based off of a kind of sweet bit of folklore where a family had their prayers answered by a group of charitable and magic spiders. In Eastern Europe, some will put spider webs up on their tree because of this story. Believe believing that spiders bring good luck and good fortune. So while this might seem like some weird Halloween or Nightmare Before Christmas decor, it's actually all inspired by a bit of folklore. The story goes that a widow and her children had tended to their holiday tree all year, hoping that when the time came, they would have enough money to decorate it. Sadly, their funds were low and they were unable to do so when the time finally came. The children were so sad on Christmas Eve, they went to bed, laid down, and cried themselves to sleep. Aww. The spiders heard their cries of misery and decided to do some good for the family. They weaved webs on the tree all night long and in the morning when the family awoke, they saw the light hit the webs on the tree and watched the webs transform into silver and gold. With this gift of great and magical wealth, the family was never poor again. It's creepy and sweet. But before we go any further, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. <laughs> Thanks for doing it.
Coming in at number eight, we have the carolers. Nowadays, it's thought to be fairly annoying for a group of people to come knocking at your door singing sappy Christmas songs. But nothing is worse than witnessing the wrath of the carolers back in the 1700s. Back then, carolers were more like a rowdy group of people that would go door to door demanding food and drinks. If denied, then they would tend to break down doors until they get what they want. Imagine that, having someone burst through your front door on Christmas and start eating all your food. That has to be one of the worst traditions out there. How is that even legal? Number seven, Holly. Everyone loves to decorate for the holidays, whether it be lights or tinsel or holiday trees or fake snow. Traditionally, a bit of greenery has always been a part of the festive decor, whether it be mistletoe, ivy, or holly. But do you know why we decorate with holly? Holly was used originally because it was believed it protected your home and family against witches. Yeah, true story. Another strange and kind of creepy thing about why we choose holly first when it comes to that splash of green and red is that holly was originally meant to represent the crown of thorns, which Jesus wore. Holly both has thorns and those cheery yet apparently gruesome bright red berries, which obviously in this case would represent beads of blood. Making our way down the list, number six, we have Rende. This is an ancient Irish Christmas tradition that basically involved killing small birds, wrens. It's believed to date back to the 1940s in Ireland. On December 26th, also known as St. Stephen's Day, young boys would go out wren hunting. Once they successfully catch and kill the bird, they will place it on the top of a pole and then decorate it. From there, they would carry their dead bird door to door. They would typically be dressed in straw masks or would have their face darkened with burnt cork. Then at each house they would sing the Ren Boy song and demand money. There you go. Number five, Christmas colors. Blood you'd think would be an uncommon part of our holiday celebrations and festive cheer. And yet, the holiday colors we are most used to seeing are red and green, white and gold. White is obviously something that has come to represent snow. Gold represents wealth, though originally it was actually meant to symbolize one of the three gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus. The gift when given was meant to represent kingship and stands as a symbol of wealth and royalty even now. Green is meant to represent the eternal evergreen and immortality. Red, however, is meant to once again represent the blood of Jesus. So just think about that when you reach for extra cranberry sauce on the holidays. Moving on to number four, we have the horse's skull. Nowadays, we decorate our homes with trees and bright lights and cute little wreaths. But back in the day in South Wales, people celebrated by decorating a horse's skull and placing it on a pole. This was referred to as Mary Lude or Holy Mary. The skulls were decorated with bells and ribbons and then a sheet was placed over the back of the head. Then they would take their horse skull and go door to door with it, singing and showing off their creation. On top of that, they would even sometimes challenge families to a battle of rhyming insults in Welsh. After that's all done, they would come inside for some food. I personally thought those little elves on the shelves were creepy, but that's nothing in comparison to this. Number three, Yule Cats. In Iceland, it's important to make sure you get your hands on some new clothes before Christmas Day, as if you don't, you'll have to face the wrath of the Yule Cat. The Yule Cat is a giant monstrous beast who is believed, according to Icelandic holiday folklore, to roam the countryside, hunting down those who have not yet received new clothes as a holiday gift to wear for Christmas Eve. Initially, people used the Yule Cat as incentive to motivate and scare workers into working harder so they could earn a nice new set of clothing to wear on Christmas Eve. Hard workers would be rewarded with new clothes, and those that didn't work hard enough would not receive any, leaving them to become prey for the fearsome and ferocious Yule Cat. And at number two, we have the Snapdragon. This was a traditional game that families would play back in 1600 England. The game, Snapdragon, sometimes called Flap Dragon, would involve raisins and almonds being placed in a bowl of brandy that was then set on fire. Then all players would stick their hands in the flaming bowl and try to retrieve the raisins. Once you successfully pull out a raisin, you must extinguish it by putting it in your mouth. Sounds like a very dangerous game to be playing, but believe it or not, mainly kids would play this game. But eventually, the popularity of the game died down as people were getting serious burns playing it. Well, 
No duh, you're literally submerging your hand into flames and then eating a fiery raisin. Like, what did you expect? There's no way that could have gone right. Coming in at number eight, we have the cat food console. I'm sure you guys have heard of the recent debacles of people ordering PS5s and them not arriving, but instead they get a big box of cat food at their front door. If that happened to me, I think I would spontaneously combust. But as it turns out, this isn't the first time that something like this has happened. Well, kinda. This story was pulled from Reddit, and while it's not as brutal as the first two, it's still just as scary, I think. A Reddit user talked about how on Christmas, when they were only eight years old, they were ripping open presents under the tree. They were having a great time, and then they got to one that really changed the mood in the room. It was a box of cat food. They were shocked at first, and then they were upset, but they quickly understood that this was a joke, and then they turned to laugh with their family. But the look on their parents' face was pure horror. Apparently, this box of cat food was supposed to be a laptop. They had wrapped the gift themselves. His parents were shocked and grilled the other members of the family who were there, but no one knew what was going on. In the end, they never found out what happened to the laptop. What might have happened is someone broke into the house and replaced the present with duds that had the same wrapping paper. That's uh, that would suck. Coming in at number seven, we have the night before Christmas. If you're gonna put some work out there, you better slap your name on it because people will try and take credit for it if you don't. To this day, no one knows who sent the poem "Twas a Night Before Christmas" to the Troy newspaper in 1823. The author, Clement Clark Moore, came forward to take credit for it, but there are several people who think it would have been impossible for Moore to write this piece. For one, the dude was a sourpuss who had no love in his heart. That's a real thing that people would say about him. And when rewriting the poem, he wrote the names of the two reindeer as Donner and Blitzen, as we all know them. But the only reason that those names are like that is because of a printing error. The original names were Dunder and Blitzen, which are Dutch for thunder and lightning. Coming in at number six, we have Patty Vaughn. Patty Vaughn and her husband were slowly splitting up. They had already decided that they didn't want to be together anymore, but things were kind of complicated because they had three kids together. Tensions kept building until everything exploded on Christmas Eve. Patty Vaughn's husband, JR, found out that she was already seeing other people. Patty fled the house and took off with her van. This was the last time that anyone heard from her. Her van was found later with blood splattered in it. An investigation was launched, but no evidence ever came back to link JR to the death of his missing wife. Eventually, he moved his family out of state, and it stands as a mystery to this day. Some of the more plausible explanations for this are that JR and his family tracked down Patty, and as a group, they killed and disposed of her body. But to this day, Nothing has been solved. Coming in at number five is the Arson Bandit. Back in the 1970s, a series of fires were lit in a small town in the southern United States. These were violent acts that seemed to be all targeted at family homes. But then again, it might have just been random. Eight fires were lit for unknown reasons, and all of them were done on Christmas Eve within a five mile radius of each other. It would seem that none of these families had anything in common with each other, so these fires were most likely lit at random. Someone was out there and just wanted to watch the world burn. Next on the list, we have Kimberly Maria McLean. This is a wild story. Kimberly McLean was married to a very wealthy man in Texas. The two of them had a family, but he was very suspicious of her. Kimberly was a very secretive person, and she would tell her husband very little about her past. Eventually, her lies started to catch up with her, and her husband wanted the truth. Kimberly kept lying. This led to her husband divorcing her, and this made Kimberly fall into a deep depression. On Christmas Eve, she would walk onto her in-law's front lawn and take her own life. This launched a massive investigation, and it turns out that Kimberly McLean had been using a fake identity this whole time. Her husband didn't even know her as Kimberly. The name he knew her as the entire time was Lori Erica Ruff, and that was the third identity she had used. She had been jumping from persona to persona ever since she was 17 years old when she ran away from home. She was able to take the identity of a dead person and get a social insurance number, and then she changed her identity again when she moved to Texas. Coming in at number two, we have Tracy Mertens. Tracy Mertens was dating Joey Cavana, and the two of them were raising their children together. They weren't in the best relationship, and Joey had an on-again, off-again battle with 
This led to him constantly owing people money. They had just moved to a new town and it was just a few days before Christmas when they were all set to settle down. Tracy went back to their old home to grab the last few things but in that moment she was attacked. Two men grabbed her, tied her up and started to interrogate her to find out where her boyfriend was. They would later take her to a church and try to kill her by lighting her on fire. She would survive long enough to give her story to the police but due to complications she would die a few days later. To this day no one knows who might have killed Tracy Mertens. Her boyfriend Joey Kavana has been questioned several times about who could have committed these crimes but he insists that he has no idea who could have done this. And coming at the number one spot we have the disappearance of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. This was one of the biggest missing person cases to ever hit New Zealand. This took place right after Christmas. Ben Smart and Olivia Hope were having a big night of partying. They were seen at the Furno Lodge which was a hot spot that night. There were a ton of people celebrating. The two of them met a stranger that offered them a ride back to a yacht where the two of them could keep partying all night long. They jumped on the boat and got ferried over to this yacht. I mean it would be hard to say no to something like that. Well this would be the last time that anyone would see them. Their parents would report them missing and after a thorough investigation they found that Scott Watson could be the killer. He was later convicted of killing both of them but to this day the remains of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope have never been found. Some people believe that Scott is innocent and he has appealed this case several times. In 2020 the case was reopened to investigation. Starting off this list at number 10. Do you hear what I hear is a classic Christmas song that you'll for sure hear walking down the aisles of the grocery store. This song has countless covers and the lyrics basically loosely tell the story of the nativity of Jesus as it is told in the Gospel of Matthew but because of the fact that Jesus is never actually mentioned by name it gives it slightly less of a religious feel. Also the fact that it has repeating verses makes it an amazing choice for choirs around the holidays. So what is hidden in the song? Well it was written in 1962 by Gloria Shane Baker and Noel Regney and it's honestly kind of about them being terrified of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Who would have thought? The lyrics about the star with a tail as big as a kite is actually about a missile and the ending where they are praying for peace everywhere was a lot more literal and a lot more dark than I knew. In our number 9 spot we have Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Before I dive into this one guys, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button because it really helps us out. Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas is a gorgeous, slow, sweet song that is really a Christmas classic. This song was originally sung by Judy Garland in 1944 for the movie Meet Me in St. Louis and was written by Hugh Martin. While listening to this song, one thing that we didn't know is how it originated. Hugh was tasked with writing this song to show the movie's family's sadness over celebrating their last Christmas in their home before having to move. The song originally featured lyrics like, have yourself a merry little Christmas, it may be your last. Or the lyric that turned into hang a shining star upon the highest bow was originally, from now on we'll have to muddle through somehow. This is definitely not the same tone of the song that we all know and love today, although the slow nature of the song makes a lot more sense to me now. While I'm sure it was pretty frustrating for Hugh to have everyone telling him that the song Song was too depressing, I'm glad that it ended up turning into the holiday classic that it is. In our number 8 spot we have Santa Claus is Coming to Town. This song is a straight Christmas banger but it holds a pretty sad story when we look at its creation. The song was written in 1934 by a man named Haven Giuseppe. Haven was asked to write a Christmas song for children which seems like a pretty easy task but right before this meeting with his publisher he had actually just come from his brother Irwin's funeral. When you're struggling with the loss of someone so close to you, I can't imagine it would be simple to write a cheery, upbeat song for children, but Haven managed to do it. On his train ride home, he thought about all of his favorite Christmas memories that he shared with his brother, and thus Santa Claus's Coming to Town was born. This song of course blew up and is always played around the holidays even today. Haven definitely made a wonderful thing out of his memories with his brother, and 
After all, isn't that kind of what the holidays are about? Spending time and creating beautiful memories with your loved ones that you can truly cherish forever. In our number 7 spot today we have Oh Holy Night. While the song itself doesn't hold a dark message, it's the creation of the song that has our rocky history. Placide Capot was asked to write a poem for Christmas Mass for the French Church in 1847. Capot wrote the poem based on the nativity story, but once it was finished, he thought that the poem would be more powerful if it was set to music, which is how it ended up as the song we know it to be today. He asked Adolf Charles Adams, who was a composer who wrote for operas and ballets such as Giselle and Le Corsair, to compose the score for the poem. The French Catholic Church loved the song and were totally thrilled by it, until things took a bit of a turn. Capot became a socialist, which didn't exactly sit well with the church, and then they also realized that Adams was Jewish, which again didn't sit well with the Catholic Church in 1847. The song ended up being banned and highly criticized by the church, but the French people loved it and continued to sing it. Soon it spread to other countries, and that is how it ended up remaining in our classic Christmas tunes today. In our number 6 spot we have the song I Saw Three Ships. This one isn't at the top of everyone's Christmas playlist, but it definitely is still a classic. This song has a long history since it was originated in 1666, so there is a lot of debate and speculation on what this song means. Some people believe that it is symbolic of the three wise men, or possibly the holy trinity, but there is a much darker theory about what it may possibly be about. There are a couple people who believe that the song is about the ships carrying the bodies of the three wise men to their resting places. Since the song has been around for so long, there are actually a few different versions of the lyrics, but one of the more original sets says, They said they'd got three crons. Crons apparently used to mean skulls, so this is a pretty good case for believing that this dark meaning might have been the truth behind the song. Because there are so many different versions, we probably won't ever know for sure what the original composer had in mind, but a lot of the theories are pretty strong contenders. In our number 2 spot we have probably one of the most, if not the most, famous Christmas song ever. Jingle Bells. While the song's first verse and chorus are the most widely known, there are actually a few more verses to the song, and the second verse really takes a turn. So, in the second verse, the person who is originally riding the sleigh ends up picking up a lady named Miss Fanny Bright along the way. Then the horse pulling their sleigh accidentally crashes them into a snowbank and the two are thrown out of the sleigh. This is already pretty crazy, but then another sleigh rides past them and the person in it just laughs at them as he continues, which is super rude. The song ends off with the narrator of the song giving some advice to the younger generation on how to slay, but considering his ride that we just heard about that didn't go too well, I probably wouldn't take his advice. Also, Fanny is never mentioned again in the song after the crash, so I'm really wondering what happened to her and where she went. I really did think this song was just about a fun winter sleigh ride, but boy that is not the case at all. In our number one spot today I've got one that is extremely depressing, so I'm giving you fair warning. Walking in a winter wonderland would not be the song I would have thought had a dark backstory, but I was absolutely wrong about that. This song was written during the Great Depression in 1934 by Richard B. Smith. This song is about two lovers imagining walking through a gorgeous winter paradise, enjoying each other's company, and playing in the snow, and building snowmen, and honestly it just sounds like a wonderful fairy tale tale romance, but it is the writer's life at the time that he wrote it that gives it a dark message. Richard was actually passing away from tuberculosis in a sanitarium. He wrote the song about the dream world that he wanted to escape to with his wife Jean, who he had only married one year prior to him being diagnosed with his illness. It's honestly the saddest backstory to such a wonderful song. I really hope that writing the song possibly helped make him feel a little bit better, even though he was unable to escape to this dream world that he had created. 